Hey friends, it's so good to be here with you this morning, and, and I mean that. I mean, I've been hungry to kind of get back with you. Uh, we missed three uh, weekends out of October, and just really glad to, to be back here uh, after traveling a little bit and, and a student ministry weekend. And I just want to say uh, I am hopeful and excited for the future, really. Uh, I mean that. I'm hopeful and excited for the future of our church. I, I spoke with Pastor Hunter last week, and I said, brother, uh, it's been a crazy year. Uh, who would have really thought uh, all that has, all this transition that's taken place, uh, everything that's transpired? And, and you know, uh, I said to Hunter, I said, brother, if, if God's going to do something, right, what a time would this be? Because at this point, like, only he can get the glory. Like only God can get the glory with all that's happened over this past year. Yes, we want the Lord to do something in and through us here at Seraphath Christian Church. And we want him to just get all the praise, all the admiration. And what a time, you know, what a time if he was to move his hand right now and wipe the floor with us, right? You know, and, and just really wipe us out with his love and his grace and stir our hearts with revival. And Yeah, so uh, I hope you join me in my excitement. Okay, be excited with me uh, this morning. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, hey, we're gonna, we got a lot of work to do this morning. We're talking about adoption, God adopting us. We're gonna camp out in Romans 8. We're gonna be in verses uh, 12 through 17, sit in that passage pretty much throughout the entire time. We'll jump around in some other places, but if you have your Bible, open up to Romans 8. Always encourage you to bring the Word of God along with you because we are students of that Word, right? Okay, so anyway, I, I wanna continue to be real with you. I'm gonna continue to be open with you because... Um, the Lord has been teaching me something, uh, kind of, to be honest with you, on an elementary level. All right, the Lord has kind of brought me back to the basics and has been teaching my heart something that um, really, to be honest with you, I'm like, man, I have this down. I understand this a good bit. And I was challenged by a question. I was reading a book on my flight home from Nepal. We had like 18 layovers, and it took us like five weeks to get home. So I was reading a lot of books. And, uh, yeah, um, and anyway, I was reading this one book, and, and, and one question that was asked in this book was, uh, do you really believe that God loves you? Right? So I, I kind of actually, at first, just kind of skipped over it. <clears throat> but then the Spirit kind of directed me back, like, do I really believe that God loves me. Like really, like do I really, really, do I believe that he loves me? This seems so elementary. This seems so basic. Like my first response is, well, of course, I, like God loves me. Yeah, of course. Like, you know, I kind of grew up in the church. I hear about this. Uh, I, I know, does God love me? But he, here's the thing, like the Lord was just pressing on my heart. Like, do I honestly believe that God, he not only loves me, but that he likes me. Not just because theologically I could explain that, of course God loves me, like, but do I really, in my guts, as a person, as a son of the Father, do I believe that the Father loves me? <clears throat> I was confronted with this, and, and to be honest with you, it shook me a bit. It shook me a bit. I mean, I speak of this all the time. I'm up here and I'm preaching and I'm telling you, God loves you. God loves us. I'm sitting down with people in coffee shops and in my office saying, God loves us. God's love has transformed my life. God's love is transforming the world. People who don't love Jesus, I'm telling them Jesus loves them. But here's the thing, like, if I believe this, it has tremendous implications. If I believe that God loves me, it is huge. It alters absolutely everything, even my mind. It alters who I am. It defines me anew. It gives me new identity. It gives me new purpose. It gives me new confidence. And all week, I've been like, just kind of checking myself, like, Rich, is my soul, Rich, is your soul awakened to God's love? Do 
I read? Do I know it? Do I get it? I want to invite you into this question. I want to invite each one of you into this question because this week I took time and I, I spoke with some mentors of mine. I spoke with friends, with family, and just kind of sharing this. And what I'm realizing is so many of us believe that God loves us without really believing that God loves us. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? Like so many of us believe that God loves us without actually comprehending that God loves us, without actually getting that God is our Father. So many of us kind of know it in our head, but we haven't connected it to our heart that God, the creator of the universe, loves us. Brennan Manning has this quote, and it says, <clears throat> Living in awareness of our belovedness is the axis around which the Christian life revolves. Being the beloved is our identity, the core of our existence. It is not merely a lofty thought, an inspiring idea, or one name among many. It is the name by which God knows us and the way that he relates to us. Fellow Christian, we need to get this. We need to drink this in. This is the core of our existence, the core of our reality, that we are loved by God himself. We need to know that we are, we are known, we're loved, We've been adopted by a good father who cares deeply, deeply for his sons and daughters. This is big. So let's pray and then we'll dive into the text. But, but friends, fellow believer, enter into this with me. Like don't just do church. Like ask the Lord right now, Lord teach me your love. If you don't love Jesus, don't be afraid to say, Lord, teach me your love. If you're real, teach me. In fact, if you're not asking that question, why aren't you asking it? Give it a go. If you don't call on the Lord and say you don't believe in the Lord, then how can you say you don't believe in the Lord if you've never called on him? So let's call on him now. God, we, we ask you to teach us now. Open our hearts to what you have for us, Lord. Open our hearts to what your love is, God. Show us, O oh Lord, that those who you have adopted, those who you have called to yourself here, Lord, are sons and daughters, Lord, and even show those who don't call you Father yet, Lord, show them that you are calling them. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, <clears throat> amen. All right, so Romans 8 is where we're going to be, and Hunter's bringing back the tradition, which I love. So if you will stand uh, in honor of the reading of God's word, we'll be in verses 12 to 17. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live According to the flesh you will die, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of the Lord. We thank you, God. Teach us now. We can take a seat. <clears throat> so Paul here, leading into chapter 8, Okay, in verse, or in chapter 7, he starts talking about life in the Spirit. What does it mean as a believer to have the Spirit of God reside within you, and how is that going to affect your life? So in the middle of Paul's discourse about life in the Spirit, right in the middle of chapter 8, we see Paul start to talk about how the Spirit 
of God within us confirms our adoption by God himself. When we are saved, the Spirit of God confirms and tells us, you are a son, you are a daughter of God. I mean, look, it's right there in verses 15 and 16. It says this, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And get this, the Spirit of God is, is what's, what the Lord is saying here in this next verse. The Spirit of God, the Spirit himself, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. This is tremendous. This is what separates God, our God, through his son Jesus Christ. This is what separates him from every other God in the world. God, little g God. God calls us to intimacy with him. So much happens on the day of our salvation when we are saved, but adoption is what draws us close to God himself. In fact, let, let's go to theology class here. Th what happens when we are saved is we are regenerated. Regeneration. There is a new spiritual life within. God's not just weaving a new thread into our, our blanket of life. He is giving us a completely new blanket. We are regenerated. But not only are we regenerated, but we are justified. We're justified in front of the God who we turned our backs on in the beginning, and we have right standing with God. So that's God doing the saving, but then God does the adopting, and he draws us in to who he is. Adoption it has God's love written all over it. Adoption is an act of God whereby he is the act of God whereby he makes us members of his family. He creates that close relationship we have with him. This is a beautiful thing. John 1.12 says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. God gave them the right to become children of God. Believer, what does this mean for us? It means we're children of the king. It means that we are members of the royal family. You know what it means? This is going to sound Sunday school, but we got to go back to Sunday school sometimes to really get the beauty of God and his love for us. It means that we are princes and princesses who will reign with Christ over the new heavens and the new earth. You remember the time in Sunday school for you who grew up in the church and you like got tiaras and crowns and stuff and you're like, oh, you're, you know, royal family, you know. But that is our reality. Like that is our inheritance. That's our future. That is real. We're part of God's royal family. This is a beautiful thing. And for you church folk like me, you grew up in the church, don't be numb to this. Wake up with me. Wake up with me. Because this is a beautiful reality. As believers, my friends, we've been adopted. We're eternally God's sons and daughters. Eternally. Like the day you were saved, right now, and in 10 million years, God's sons and daughters. We have all of the benefits of membership into a family. Praise the Lord. And believer, this is a glorious truth. This needs to be the melody of our hearts, and, and we need to believe it. God loves us. He's adopted us. Maybe you're like, Rich, I know. Well, if you're just saying, I know, Rich, says, I know this. Well, then you're not in the right mindset because we need to be in awe of it. So let's zoom in and talk about the implications of adoption. We're going to talk about four things. What does this mean that we are as sons and daughters of God? What does this mean for us? Well, it means, I, I'm going to talk about four things today. Number one, that we, as God's sons and daughters, we are chosen and kept. We're chosen by God and we are kept by him. Number two, that we are loved and cherished. We are free from bondage free from our past, and that we are eternal heirs with Jesus. So let's start. Number one, we are chosen and kept. Ephesians 1.5 says this, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Christ according to the purpose of his will. This whole predestination thing, this whole chosen thing, scares some of us. 
okay? I get it. It scares some of us. I understand that because we here in America, we like to make up our mind. But here's the thing. God has told us he adopted us. Like adoption today, the adopter initiates adoption. Like God chooses us. Think of that. Think of you. God, the perfect one, chooses us. No man, no woman has the right in himself or herself to be adopted. It's pure grace from the adopter. Pure grace, my friend, my fellow believer, we have been sought after by God for his purposes. He has chosen us, but not only has he chosen us, he's also keeping us. We're not just sought, but we're secure in him forever. Adoption doesn't have an expiration date. Moms and dads here, like your kids are always your kids, right? Your kids are always your kids. So often we think we're on thin ice with God and we think we're going to fall through and we think we're going to get lost. But the thing is, like, we have been, if we've been adopted by God, if we've surrendered our life to him, we've been saved, we are forever kept by him. We don't turn 18 and then have to move out the house because mom and dad can't afford you eating of all their pantry items. That's not what happens here. God, we are forever adopted by him. He never stops keeping us. And the be- beautiful thing is he doesn't kick us out when we fail. Like he just doesn't do that. Our confidence in our adoption, our confidence in our salvation is in God the Father, not in us. If our confidence was in us, that's going to be as frail as before we knew Christ. Our confidence is in God himself. And I love this example from a pastor who I listen to and read from, Matt Chandler, who always gives about his family, and I just have been applying it to my life. Like, so, so my daughter, Kaya, was born on February 1st, okay? And my wife, you know, it was a crazy nine months. She did the pregnancy thing well, but she had morning sickness, like, all day. Any ladies are like, okay, yeah, I understand. All power to you. Thank you. Okay, respect given forbearing children. I don't have to go through that. But uh, the, the pain that you go through, men kind of equate that to a cold. So there's no way that we could ever reach that level of, of pain that you go through. But um, my wife, like nine tough months, two trimesters of, of sickness. And, and then, uh, you know, my wife, because of some uh, health issues, had to be induced. On, on, I remember going in on a Sunday night after church that day. And, and we uh, went to the hospital and Kai didn't come until Wednesday. All right, so then she comes rip-roaring into this world, and she comes out, and she's wailing, she's screaming, she needs to be cleaned up, she needs to be dressed, and then over the next week, we need to change her and clothe her, and then clothe her 18 more times because diapers don't work for newborns for some reason, okay, and there's, there's just body fluids everywhere, okay, but anyway, just like Kaya just constantly needs, constantly just like wailing, constantly needs attention, constantly needs to be held. She's literally came out the most self-centered little human I've ever met. So needy. Literally offered my wife and I nothing. (laughs) Nothing. But here's the thing. Nothing could stop the overwhelming love and joy we had towards her when she came out. Like she offered us nothing. Like, we weren't like, you know what, we're gonna, Kate and I had a conversation. We're going to wait until she could walk and talk and feed herself before we really, you know, t- take up parenting her again. We're, we're going to just wait for some future version of her to take her back in as a daughter. No, that's not how it works. We loved and still love helpless little Kaya. We d- I'd die for that little girl. I would die for her. I mean, just this morning, trying to clothe her, this new thing, it's like a wrestling match. Like, she throws elbows, and I need to pin her against the thing and, like, try to clothe her, and she's trying to get away. And I'm like, you're naked. I need to put clothes on you. But, like, she just fights it still. But here's the thing. I'm going to clothe her until she can clothe herself because I'm her dad. Like, nothing can change that. I am her dad, and she is my daughter. No matter what. No matter what. And Christian, fellow believer, 
He is our Father. No matter what, no matter how much you just don't give, no matter how much you haven't changed, no matter how much you fail, He is our Father. He's chosen us, and He continues to choose us. He continues to keep us. He's not waiting for future you. He's not changing His mind. If He's adopted you, you are His forever, fully chosen, fully kept. He knew about you when He adopted you. He's God imperfect, sloppy, you and me is who he adopted. And the Lord, our God, doesn't cast off his children. He just doesn't. So let me ask you this question, friends. Do we believe that we are chosen and kept? Not only are we chosen and kept, but we're loved and we're cherished. Psalm 147, 11 says, The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. And if I'm being honest, this is something I kind of have trouble with. Like, God delights in us. God delights in you and me. This is the hardest for me to get. Sometimes I kind of view God as this cosmic referee who's ready to call me out of bounds or call a foul on me and, and tell me I'm doing wrong, always pointing the finger. But here's the thing. He delights in me and you. God delights in me and you. He loves us. He cherishes us. J.I. Packer has this quote. He says, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not yet the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he doesn't understand Christianity very well at all. For everything that Christ taught, everything that makes the New Testament new and better than the old, everything that is distinctively Christian as opposed to merely Jewish is summed up in the knowledge of the fatherhood of God. Father is the Christian name for God. And my friends, this is scandalous. This is scandalous because if we understand who we are, if we understand theologically who we are, we are sinners. We're depraved. We are broken people. God has taken the very worst, the very ones that opposed him. God is fully holy, fully perfect, and we aren't. Perfection doesn't know imperfection. That's a thing. And God has taken the very worst to be his children. We are everything that was repulsive to him. We turned our backs on him, and he sent Jesus to redeem us by the cross, to clothe us in righteousness. It's a beautiful thing. And God doesn't just save, like I said. Salvation is beautiful in itself, but God doesn't just redeem, he adopts. He adopts and calls sons and daughters, and this allows for intimacy. It allows for us to call the Lord of all, Abba, Father, this cozy familial name that was used around the households of that time in the ancient Near East. It's warm and close. When we pray, believer, we can pray to our, our dad. And I just want to say, like, I want to be real. I know some of us hear about the love of God the Father. And we have no earthly example of a father's love. Our father has broken us, betrayed us, hurt us. Wherever you're at with this, friends, I know, like, you don't need to know too many people or have too many family members to realize that, like, fathers mess up and fathers are absent and some people don't have the the grace of a father who's present and deeply loving. In fact, I mean, I, I think about this story in, in Nepal. When I was in Nepal, it, it is custom there where, where friends, people who are, are friendly, uh, you know, guys or girls, whoever it is, can, can hold hands, okay? Just walking down the street or sitting together, they'll hold hands. And when I was in Nepal, um, there was this fella who I trekked up the mountain with, and he was a really good dude. And, and uh, we were sitting there by the fire. We grew really close together, a lot of good, in-depth conversation. And, and one day we were sitting there by the fire, and I was just happy to not be trekking for like five minutes. So anyway, uh, he, he grabs my hand. And in America, like if you're not my wife or my daughter, 
bro. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, we don't do that. I warmed up. I warmed up. I, I, I pivoted a little bit, you know. I, but at this time, he grabbed my hand. My hand was down, and I was like, <laughs> like, I pulled up. And it was just reaction. Like, I'm like, whoa. And he was like, and then I realized quickly, because I knew this is a thing, but just my quick reaction. And I was like, whoa, warming my hands by the fire here, you know. And, and uh, he was really cool about it. I, I don't think it even crossed his mind. Uh, but anyway, here's the thing. Like, with the Father's love towards us, when I talk about God the Father, like literally God the Father, get this, loving you. And you're not used to that. You pull back. You just don't get it. No way. But I just want to say right here, you, I, I've been, oh man, my, my dad's a good dad and I'm so grateful for it. But I want to say those of you who have been hurt, broken by dad, God the Father has a pure, perfect, deep, unending love for you. You need to separate, you need to separate daddy from God the Father. You just do. And that's not easy. It takes time. You need to talk with friends. You need to talk with fellow Christians. Dig in, though, and separate that. Here's the thing. God's love and how much he cherishes us leaves us safe and secure. And we need to know that the king loves us, right? We need to know that this is the king who loves us. Like, we can't fall, even with good dads, like, even with my dad, like, I can't fall into the comparison trap and be like, oh, God is like my dad because God the Father is infinitely better than my father who has issues and has made mistakes. Just like me as a dad, I have issues and I'm making mistakes. God the Father is infinitely better than any one of our earthly fathers. Guys, we need to know God's love in light of who he is, and he lacks nothing. We can't get caught up. Sometimes we get caught up in the kind of Abba Daddy thing, and we kind of make God this like Mr. Rogers with a cardigan. He's going to bake cookies. I don't even know if Rogers bakes cookies, but whatever. Like, and we kind of like make him this soft guy when he's the king of everything. Amen. And he leaves us safe and secure, and his love is fierce. And we don't say, oh, you know, talk to, talk to my daddy. This is my daddy. We say, we say, my Abba, my father. Have you seen my father? Have you seen who he is? Do you know this guy? This is my dad. He holds the world. He holds the cosmos in his hands. And he holds my heart in his hands too. That's my dad. We don't, we don't try to make God this soft thing. No. He's the God of everything, and he leaves us safe and secure. My friends, do we believe this? We're chosen and kept. We're loved and cherished. Man. Not only that, but we're also free from bondage. We're free from our past life. We have an opportunity to be shaped and molded differently because we belong to a new family. We belong to a new family. Like, think about that. Like, you, the God of the universe, you're a son or daughter. If you're a believer, you're a son or daughter of him. Like, we can walk with some swagger. We can have confidence. Not only has he adopted us, not only do we have eternal inheritance, but he's freed us from our former lives that we thought that that was all the inheritance we were going to get. No, we're getting the inheritance, the eternal, glorious inheritance of Jesus Christ. We were once bound, suppressing the truth, slaves to sin, and that always leads to fear. But here's the thing. When we're brought into a new family, we're changed. We're adopted. We have new desires. The Spirit encourage us, encourages us to be like our dad. And believer, we feel this, right, with, with con conviction, with the wooing of the Spirit kind of pulling us along, saying, hey, that's not the right thing. Here's what's good and right and honorable to the Lord. And I want to make a quick side note. Friends, if you don't long for the things of God, I want to be careful here. If you don't long for the things of God, you need to ask yourself, is God your Father? 
Because we see in Romans 8, and I would encourage you to go back and read Romans 8, 1 through 8, but we see that the Spirit of God convicts us and pulls us into the things of God, makes us long for the things of God. Not, not that we're not, not going to mess up. We're going to mess up. We're going to fail. But the thing is, the Spirit shows our hearts, hey, come on in. Go deeper. And nominalism is such a problem. The American church is doing such a disservice. People come to church on Sunday and then go home, and they think, guess what? Matthew 7 irks me. People are going to go to the heavenly gates one day and say, Lord, Lord, I'm ready to come in. I've done all these things in your name. And the Lord's going to say, I never knew you. Friends, if you don't feel an urgency to obey the Lord, you might not know him. I don't say that to scare you, to make you question your salvation because you're safe and secure if you know Jesus. You're safe and secure. You don't doubt that. But if you have no tendency towards obedience, ask the question. We are chosen. We're kept. We're loved. We're cherished. We're free from bondage. God's adopted us. He frees us from our former gods, little g gods. He compels us to himself how beautiful is this? And, and last but not least, my friends, as sons and daughters, we are eternal heirs. First Peter 1 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance, get this, to an inheritance. We are eternal heirs of this inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Friends, we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ himself. All that Christ will inherit, Christ right now at the right hand of God the Father, all that we will inherit is ours too. Think about how secure Jesus Christ is right now at the right hand of God the Father. That's how secure we could be. Jared Wilson writes a great sermon on that. That is how secure we could be. As secure as Christ is, believer, adopted one, that is how secure we can be. And our inheritance looks beautiful because we get three things. We get a new world, a new heavens and a new earth, and we're going to reign over that world. We also get new bodies, resurrected bodies. Like that ache you feel right now, you won't have it. Medication isn't a thing. You won't even need, when you feel a cold coming on, to get some thieves oil out and start running that through. That's for my girl, Ariel Janho, all right? You're welcome, essential oils, friends. I love you. But, like, that's not a thing. Like, we don't need remedies because Jesus is the remedy and we're going to get all of him. That is the third thing. We get all of God in our inheritance forever, perfected, all of him, unfettered, glory, glory. And Christian, we feel this, right? We feel this in, in chapter 8, uh, verse 19 says, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. We feel our inheritance is coming. We feel our adoption will be sealed in full when we go and spend eternity with God himself. And I want to say, unbeliever, you feel eternity in your heart too. Ecclesiastes tells us that you feel the longing, that there's something more. You feel it. You've got to feel it, right? You feel that in, in possibly how you can never achieve and how, how all the money in the world, all of the, all of the relationships in the world, all this stuff, everything. You can have whatever you want and you put your head down the pillow at night and, and are you satisfied? God gives us that satisfaction. We all long for eternity except the sons and daughters of God know that we've been adopted into eternity with God himself. 